Soup is a great network that helps bring IT solutions and information and resources to the not-for-profit sector so that we can all use technology to further our mission and our work. So there's lots of, lots of tools out there. It can be overwhelming um, for sure, but with good community partners like Neighborhood Nexus um, that can help us access information, I think that makes it a lot easier. We all know that when we're writing grants, oh, <laughs> Chandra, you're also with True Colors, awesome. I know sometimes when we're writing grants, one of the questions that I see explain your the population that you're serving or what is the need that you're trying to address? How do you know that need is out there? What data are you? And so as I have discovered neighborhood this, as long as you don't start going too far down the rabbit hole and just clicking on maps, which I have a tendency to do, is an incredible resource to really paint the landscape of what our communities look like that we are serving and how our missions can help address the needs that are in that community. I've had, my role is I'm with the Cobb Collaborative, which is a nonprofit based here in Metro Atlanta in Cobb County. We're part of the statewide Georgia Family Connection Partnership, which is a statewide public-private partnership to improve outcomes for children and families across Georgia. In COP, we do that specifically through a mental health awareness campaign and the third grade reading initiative, as well as a civic engagement initiative. And I have had the pleasure of meeting Tommy Pierce pre-shutdown when he was, had been on the job for about one week in Cobb County. Luckily, he had some months to get his sea legs under him before this crazy pandemic hit us. And I think the need for information and easily accessible information, as his very first slide references, has just grown since then as we have been looking for creative ways to address needs in our community. So I will let Tommy add anything from a personal or professional standpoint that he would like to, but I'm going to turn it over to him now. Tommy? Yep. Thanks, Irene. And it's great to be with Kenny Lee on True Colors Theater today. I'm Tommy Pierce. I'm the Executive Director of Neighborhood Nexus. I'm, I made an assumption for this that y'all don't want to look at data for an hour or for 45 minutes. And so I'm going to talk more about what Neighborhood Nexus is and what we offer so that you know what we are as a capacity building resource. And then I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we're thinking about these days, especially given the pandemic, racial reckoning, economic crisis, all of this, and how we're rethinking a lot of data, especially for the Atlanta region, but really statewide. And then arts and theater was not really on my list, but let's like, I would love to learn more about how we can better support your sector. This might be a perfect opportunity for me to, and I'll also start by saying, I am not a data scientist. I lead a whole team of data scientists and geographers. I'm a social worker. And so I'm trying to be a translator of the data and work that we do to make it immediately usable for your organization. My background, I spent seven or eight years in the consulting department at Georgia Center for Nonprofits and got a long history working with um, doing strategic planning and data work through them, which I know, Chandra, you, I, know, I remember you were pretty involved before. I think you, were you at C5 before? Yeah. Like, okay. Was. Got it. Okay. So, yeah. I'm, I'm always in the background, so I know what's going on, even if you don't know me. Y'all are my people. Y'all are my people. So we have community events community programming in addition to what we do on stage we exist at the intersection of artistic excellence and civic engagement josh phillipson from the lma actually exposed our a lot of arts leaders to neighborhood nexus and someone came in i think it was i can't remember his name but don't worry about it who took us through it so i was really intrigued by what we could do with it so when i saw this this seminar was that we really would like to do this especially with barry coming on to true colors and a few months ago just understanding how we can use some of this data for grants and how to target some of our community event our impetus for being here as a theater company that's great so i've got like a million slides too many let's make it more of a conversation though so as we go through like just ask questions and I love Josh. So I'm glad he's out there talking about us. We're both like, he, he works for Atlanta regional commission and we operate out of ARC. And so I, I see him almost every day actually. 
every day we're in the office. All right. So I'm going to, I'll just start going through these, but like truly make this a conversation. Feel free to ask questions, interject, or even tell me like what you're thinking about or, or what information you wish you had or what you've even been doing that might be helpful. All right. So here again, we're going to talk about our, I'm going to talk about our organization and then really how we approach data. And then I can do like some demo, but usually that's only helpful for a couple of people. So that could even be a follow-up if y'all are interested. So Neighborhood Nexus is, we're a collaborative. We operate at the intersection of ARC, where we're actually housed and operate at a community foundation. That's our fiscal agent. So our back office is run over the community foundation. But we also have two other core partners, the, the Metro Chamber and the United Way. And so that really puts us right at the intersection of regional planning and philanthropy and human services and business, and really trying to use data to grow the footprint and the understanding for each of those audiences that they serve, because those four organizations have pretty distinct constituents. And then we're also the local or state representative of the National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership, which is based out of the Urban Institute. And so we are also constantly working with 30 to 40 other cities across the country that are doing similar things to us, which is figuring out how to make data more accessible, but then also how to make it really an actionable resource for organizations serving in their respective regions. And for us, we've got a statewide footprint, but serve mostly Metro Atlanta. Our mission is to grow a culture of data-informed decision-making across Georgia's social impact sector. So not just making data available, but really trying to change the culture around how we make decisions that impact the communities we serve. We want those to be data-informed and we want those to really be positively impacting it. And so it's really about changing a culture, not just making more data available. And then I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but we have a pretty consistent approach to everything we do, whether it's internally working on projects or in our training or whatever it is, we're always trying to follow four steps, which is starting out by asking the right questions and knowing those questions often change over time, but typically people will start off with the data and then you get lost or overwhelmed almost immediately. So understanding what problems we're trying to solve, what questions we're trying to answer, then go out and find the best data, then make sure you're, we're telling a compelling story with a call to action, which is going to be super important for Barry as he tries to raise money. You got to end with that call to action and then making informed decisions. So if you're making, writing a new strategic plan or designing a new pro, understanding like who needs to be involved in that, not always just the numbers or just the data, but also thinking about the unintended impact that those programs might have. And even with the data, really thinking through what our decisions mean to the communities we serve. To do all of this, to from making the data available to making it consumable and actionable, we really do this through three main programs. One is building and maintaining this giant data infrastructure that is housed at the Atlanta Regional Commission. And then we build some like data visualization tools on top of that. I'll give you like a couple screenshots of what that looks like. I'm not going to do a full demo, but basically if you want to look at the state or counties or cities or zip codes or legislative jurisdictions or census tracts across the whole state, or even Atlanta neighborhoods and neighborhood planning units, we can, we have, we process census data, student data, public health data at all of these different geographies across the whole state. And so that there's probably something in there that will help you tell the story that you're trying to tell. We also do a lot of custom work or custom projects or consulting work. So I'll show you some examples later, but basically people will come to us and say, we really want a dashboard to keep our board informed of what we're doing or, or to really track our progress for the community or around some key indicators. And so we build mapping applications, we build dashboards, we, we help write reports. And sometimes we serve as just a data partner to help think through things. Um, and then the last is really our newest program, which is around community impact or community engagement, which looks a lot like capacity building and training for nonprofit professionals, getting people more comfortable with data to understand what's out there and what they can use and take back to their organization. But it's not just training. We're trying to create some resources, but we also just want to be a good partner. And so we're in a lot of conversations about a lot of different things. And we're sometimes we're just there listening and then, and then adding data or, or our expertise when it makes sense. But it's like the beauty of collective impact initiatives is there's a lot of different roles to play. And so we try to be in a lot of conversations just to, even if we're not contributing actively, we're connecting dots across those different collaboratives. We see a lot of the same conversations going on. So that's like the, what we are and how we do it at a high level. There's a few things that I think are really important about how we approach data and, and how we try to help other organizations approach data. And the first one is being equity driven data informed. We like, we actually like this so much. We made this our tagline and we think it's really important that we aren't just being data driven, but we're actually being mission driven, community driven for us. 
being mission driven means we're closing the biggest gaps, which is advancing equity. And we like to say we're equity driven and a data informed. So equity being the, the North star data being the GPS to help get us there. And so it also represents a value system, right? So using all the data that you have available, whether that's your own program data, it might be your ticket sales data, who your audience, but also who the community is you're trying to serve, not just the people who are paying for tickets. Looking at your program data, looking at community around you and who, what your service area is, but also thinking about community voice as data. And as like, really, I've got it written here, but value, lived experience is expertise. And a lot of times we don't think about that part of things. So it's looking at your data, but it's also talking to as many people as possible. But the easy way to say it is that your quantitative data will tell you what and how much and where, but talking to people will tell you why and how it feels and maybe what some of the solutions are. Uh, we also think that, especially during the pandemic, which is where this kind of the parenthetical phrase there came out of the pandemic, which is that we really have to be hyper-focused on closing disparities and closing some of those gaps. And I wrote this slide initially for some a group of funders, but we tend to only fund groups that are maybe evidence-based or best practices, but we have to take risks. And sometimes solutions exist at the grassroots or community level. And knowing that residents might understand their own issues, being willing to fund or work with a community to, to what might be traditionally considered a risk, but actually just going for it sometimes. And then we want to be transparent and accountable for what data we're using and how and why. And we don't want to use data as, as like a power move, which is what has been the historic case. Tommy, when you talk about leveraging organizational and community wow. data, What's the scope when you say organizational? You said we look at your data. Is that down to the individual organization or is it those big ones you mentioned earlier? Oh, I think about that would be in y'all's case, the community data really is like, what's the demographics of the service area? What's that high level? We can look at income and health and education, but organizational program data, I'm thinking about who your program participants are, who your staff is, who your board is, who your ticket sales represents. It's really looking internally and then externally. I think a lot of organizations uh, are serving a lot of people, but is, does that represent who you're trying to serve and the way you understand what your potential audience is by looking at the community data, so comparing the two. Got it. So if I have, here's a people that bought tickets, I have all their zip codes. Here's where our theater is. That's a zip code. Looking at those things and how they interact. With it. You okay. might say actually, there's a lot of a lot of for market research. There's it might be a lot of opportunity, a couple of zip codes that you aren't hitting, or maybe there's a couple of zip codes that you are lower income, but you think could benefit from your programs, and you want to target them for maybe a free or reduced cost or something for a particular zip code, whatever, whatever that is. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, and then I mentioned this a few minutes ago, but really, what we're always trying to do, especially with data, which is just one of those inherently just overwhelming things for a lot of people, instead of just dropping you into the middle of a map or, or into the, what I'm trying to show in this picture here, like the jungle of data, but walking people through a door. When we do our trainings, we're always talking about data confidence, right? There is no data person and non-data person. There are people with varying degrees of confidence in data and you can build those muscles and then walking through, how do you ask a specific and answerable question? A lot of people, a lot of us have these like existential or big questions that are hard to answer with data, or maybe they're actually 10 questions just hiding behind one complex statement and making sure we're asking questions in a way that we can answer it with the data and then finding the best data. There's not always perfect data. I would say in late 2020, when everyone got their DEI committees going and they would reach out and say, send us your equity data. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. It's how you use the data to, to do things. And every organization is different. Everyone's community is different. And it's more about not putting the onus on finding perfect data, but finding the best you can right now, and then trying to work with that to, to make some change. And then we can go back and find better things or understand what we need to be looking at at other times. Oh yes. I just saw your note on the NIP members. I'll put that in the chat in just a minute. And then with data, you might make a hundred maps to figure out what you're trying to do. No one wants to see your hundred maps. They want to see like the final thing, right? It's not, when I talk to a lot of data science students, I'm always like outside of school, no one wants to see your work. They just want to know the insight or the trend or what you're trying to do. And telling a story looks like having that picture, having that anecdote or story, having a couple of facts to make sure that this is rooted in data. And then just a clear call to action that ties it all together. And then making informed decisions. Like I mentioned earlier, is really about understanding your, the implications of this is your decisions you're making, who's included in all that, and just thinking ahead about what your outcomes are going to be. Tommy, do you find that the information you're getting now from the data 
to be different or leading to different decisions post-COVID versus pre-COVID? Yeah, I think we've actually seen, I think the way I would say it is we've gotten a lot more sophisticated questions about audiences. I actually tried to map this out early last year and it got complicated, but the first couple of weeks of the pandemic, I'd get an email from like the mayor's office or say open hand. And it would say, where are the older adults that are living alone or low income so that we can get food to those? That takes us like 30 seconds because we have all that information. And I think people started to say, oh, okay, if you can tell us where low income people are, like what's, what other, what else do you have? And then starting to make those quite like those connections around, oh, housing and food, like emergency rental assistance was a big thing with the CARES Act. You start to see that you can look at these data, they all look the same. And then we can have those like systems level conversations. And then when you're having the systems level conversations, you can think about more, I, I guess, broader solutions that are also targeted to specific segments or communities. And so we've just seen the conversation get really elevated. And so we've, people ask us a lot harder questions now, which tells us that our mission, changing the culture, that there's something different about how we understand and aren't able to use data than two years ago. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think we're getting a lot better question and more fun ones for us, honestly. So y'all are here, so I'm not sure how much I need to make the case for data. Really being able to understand what your community is, what their needs are, but also what their assets are, all of that will help us make better programmatic planning, policy, and funding decisions at the right scale to the right people in the right communities. Data is like bacon too. I love that. <laughs> as, long, as long as you eat bacon. Stole that from somebody, but it was so good. I? So again, continuing that sort of case for data, walking through the logic of it, but especially during the pandemic, and to your point, Barry, we see data as a protective factor. If we understand where ahead of the crisis, we had things like child well-being index for United Way, and we build and maintain that. And even knowing like where those red zip codes are, where people born into those zip codes have like the most challenges and most barriers to, to prosperity. Like those are the same zip codes that were most affected by the pandemic. And we saw that very quickly. And so you see that the kind of gaps get a little bit bigger. And so having the data at hand already and having this infrastructure lets us know what's next. So we can't always look into the future, but we can get a good head start. Again, knowing what they're experiencing and talk, making sure we're talking to them too, and not just looking at maps, we better understand what those needs are and how we can serve. And then. Georgia Center for Nonprofits commissioned a study, or sorry, Community Foundation commissioned a study that Georgia Center for Nonprofits did in 2014. And I was the lead researcher, so I happen to know the data pretty well. We found that when, and we studied strategic planning practices and those organizations that used census data or third-party data in their planning processes, all expanded their budget, their reach, their impact, and their influence within the sector over a five-year period. So using using community data to understand your audience before writing out your three to five year plan it's going to do you a lot of good and make sure you understand your audience and what the opportunities are and there's a lot of ways to use data i think it's not always just immediately clear you hear the word data and you get overwhelmed but thinking through the really practical here's how you here's how and where you can use it can be really helpful so from strategic planning to program design marketing and not just in not advertising, but in really understanding where your place in the, in the market and who you should be serving. The easiest way to put all of this is if you provide a specific service, like you're a theater company, what neighborhood should you be in or who should you be talking to? But if you also just serve a specific community, you might want to understand what services to offer to that community. So there's a couple, want to make sure that you're aligning your programs and services to the audience you're trying to serve. And then obviously fundraising grant making, which is why Barry's here. We have this other unique case that we did with Georgia CASA, which they find volunteers to help foster youth navigate the court system. And they were really interested in how to attract volunteers in specific counties. And we were like, oh, we can use data to do this. We know how many foster youth are in every county. We know how many volunteers they have. We know how many individuals a volunteer can serve on average. And so Rather than Georgia Casa trying to figure out just spending the resources in every county, hoping to recruit enough volunteers, we made a heat map for them that helps them know exactly how many volunteers they should be trying to recruit. And they can make strategic investments in each county to do that. And they know where their kind of hot spots are and where they should really be spending their resources to make sure that the foster youth have the sort of court system navigators that they need. And so I, we had never seen data informed volunteer recruitment. And so we made it up, but we're excited about all the unique, like you can apply data to anything to make it, I think, 
easier, more streamlined, or more efficient. This is one of my favorite examples from the last couple of years. Now, I think this gets back to what Barry mentioned a couple of minutes ago, the question you asked. At the beginning of the pandemic, the World Health Organization also declared an infodemic. So this is like not a made up thing. This is actually from the World Health Organization. And that was basically that there was, it's when there's too much information to really describe, there's just so much noise that it's hard to describe the problem, let alone develop a solution. And I would say that's probably existed since social media existed in like the early 2000s, but there's so much information out there. Everyone had a pandemic dashboard or everyone became an epidemiologist and it made it really tough for people to understand what is reliable and accurate information from like the Twitter wars of like, now you should be looking at positivity rates versus seven day averages and all of this, it just makes it more confusing. And we've played the role of not trying to be, but it's a problem that we're, we've been working on for two years, but it's also a general problem that, that I think neighborhood nexus has a role in solving, which is how do we create, curate something that is just more reliable information, not just around the pandemic, but around our communities that we serve in Georgia to create a reliable place to come and find the right amount of data to use. I'm going to go through, it's going to say a short list. It's a long list of, of lessons learned from the last two years. And all of this is really informing how we think about data and how we're creating new programs. And we've seen just a huge demand spike in community data, but especially as it relates to equity. And I also, I don't think that's going away. I think funders, especially if you're not using data, you're not talking about equity, then you're not getting funding. And we were figuring out what does our role look like there? And how do we help have the conversations about that? We found a lot of our tools before the pandemic were let's throw a thousand indicators into a, a mapping software and let people explore their community. We found, especially in the crisis, like the highest peak of the crisis, but still People don't want to explore data. They want to make sense of the data. They want to be able to pri make prioritize communities and they want to make quick decisions. And so we've really rethought how we build our tools to answer those specific questions, not to throw everything in every, every, but to really focus down on what people are trying to do with data and then build something for that. We also saw a huge need for real-time data. I would go give a presentation to a board or something about the trends we're seeing in say late 2020, early 2021. And they would say, what's happening with mental health right now or in the last two weeks? And I'm like, we, since this data lags a year and a half, let alone knowing what's going on. And then mental health data is just barely exists at all. And so for us, real-time data looks like talking to a bunch of leaders in the sector and saying, what are you guys seeing? And then. In particular, what are you seeing that's making you change how you deliver your programs and what operational challenges are popping up? And we found that asking people those three questions, they're leaders in the sector, typically because they're seeing things enough times. And as a leader, they've got to make decisions. That's what really influences, tells us about what information and what trends are important. And then there's this idea from our friends over at Archie, which is the public health collaborative in Atlanta that Catherine Waller was running until recently. It's this idea of inverting the burden and especially, you know, I think the quote from late 2020 from the Georgia Food Bank Association was that 40% of the families that were receiving food from food pantries in 2020 had never interacted with the nonprofit sector before. And if you've never acted with, interacted with human service agencies, and you can imagine trying to navigate how complex and disconnected our nonprofits and organizations are. And so there's this idea around how do we make systems work for people versus people working to access the things they need. And data, again, plays a role in that, whether it's data sharing across organizations or just understanding what the demand looks like in real time. All right, this is, this is the second slide. And it's the last one of this list of lessons learned. People are using more and more data, but they are not necessarily more representative of community voice. And that's something we're trying to figure out right now is how do we capture the, what it feels to live in community, what the local priorities are in different communities across the state or across the region, or even across Atlanta neighborhoods to then inform and be able to package that up to, to make it actionable for leaders. So just because you're using census data or school data doesn't mean you're reflecting community voice. And most times we're actually using data that's very deficit focused. And so by talking to people, we can also understand what the assets in a community are. Question for you in this space. It sounds like you're talking about qualitative data, maybe. Sometimes, I mean, a lot of times, but we're also building this tool called Metro Atlanta Speaks, which is something ARC has done for a few years, but it's a, it's a, been a phone survey done annually, trying to build a community panel 
And so in three years, we want to have 10,000 residents answering monthly pulse questions. And so that could tell, that could be something like right now we, we have a question about what's the biggest priority facing the region. And for the last few years, the number one thing has been crime and public safety. I don't really believe that's really the top issue in our community. And so this year we asked the second question, which was, what's the biggest issue in your household? And actually crime was the second to last, because I think a lot of it's perception. And I don't think a lot of people actually feel threatened. And even if crime was the number one issue, that might look, the intervention or the solution might look very different in different communities. So in Buckhead, it might, you might look at crime data and realize that maybe People are calling 911 every time someone touches their car, but maybe in Southwest Atlanta, there's a culture around why would I call the police? Because that might be more dangerous than what the situation already is, right? And, and, and those communities are over-policed. So you will see an increase of 911 calls or criminal activity just because there's more people there. To, and so you, you get patterns that make it tough and you don't really understand what's really going on because the data's messy without talking to people. And so qualitative data plus just better questions that we can be asking people through search surveys. Thank you. There's a sector wide here one in the second phrase, which I've talked to a lot of students, especially at Emory in their data science department of these students that are very sophisticated data scientists that do not want to go work for Facebook or Google. They want to work for nonprofits and they usually end up talking to me with like, how do I navigate the recruitment process and the nonprofits? And I'm like, there, there isn't one, there is no like rhyme or reason to how we, there's no recruiting patterns or anything. And, and so I, I see this huge opportunity where I think in general, our nonprofits don't know how to receive data professionals, but also these new data professionals don't have the education around social issues. And so you end up with things like hackathons, right? That don't actually solve problems. They're usually surface level kind of events. And I see this opportunity to better inform data science students and the social, the complex social issues, systemic issues that we're trying to solve as a sector, and then help nonprofits understand how they can use data professionals because there's already a workforce available. And I just, I, I know there's gotta be, I don't have a clear vision, but there's gotta be some, I feel like if we give Gen Z some clear direction and let them have at it, like we're gonna, we're gonna get pretty far on some of these issues. The third one here is really about, I think Neighborhood Nexus spent the first decade of its existence making data accessible. The pandemic made me realize how actionable we need to make our information as well. And I really wanna now focus on making our data and our data tools engaging. Yeah, I really, I'm a social worker. I know that most people that come to our website don't actually want to be there. They just need an answer. They don't want to look at the data. And so I want to make our tools and our information more engaging. I want people to want to be engaged and, and then lastly, I think there's a thought leadership gap, right? Around right now, the, you get people who are the loudest saying that they're data informed or data driven are thought leaders, but there's not. There, there's been a gap about how do we advance the sector forward using data? What are the different applications and what are we missing out on by not using data? And so that's something we want to try to build in the next couple of years. So those are my thoughts on like things that we've trying to document the things we've really learned and that have really come up in the last two years. And hopefully it's also applicable to y'all's organization. Oh, okay. So this is one example. I turned an email into something that looked more interesting as like a text thread. I got this email in late, late 2020 when I was about to give a presentation. And it was like, hey, Tommy, for Thursday's meeting, it'd be great if you could walk through data to show the socioeconomic impacts of the continuing crisis. Like this is just copy and paste it from an email. And I was like, great, that's what I was going to do. And then they're like, and then the disparities of these impacts across different groups of people. So, okay, that's a little harder, but that's also like important. And then tell us what to do next. <laughs> so it was, we want you, don't tell us the data. We, again, like reinforcing the fact that people want to know that things are data informed, but they don't necessarily just want to look at data. They want to know what to do. And I was like, cool, how much time I have? And they said 20 minutes. And this is like the kinds of conversations we have been having for two, which it, I think this illustrates to Barry's point earlier, exactly how people are asking questions. Now we want, we, we need to know what's going on, but we also would like actually want recommendations on what to do next, which is new for us. We've been the data nerds for over a decade where people want us to send them a spreadsheet. People don't actually want spreadsheets. They really want to know what to do next. And I think we've had a lot of success by trying to answer these more actionable questions. And then this is, I pulled this from the one of our training slide decks because I just love it, but it's, we often rely on data to tell its own story, but we actually have to add a narrative and we have to be there to tell the story for the data that exists. We can't just make a pretty chart or a map and hope people interpret it. We really have to bring data to life and show what it means and what to do next. 
And one last illustration is this is just my, this was my go-to slide during the pandemic. This is not data. This is a, an illustration that, that shows what the data you know, shows the same thing as the data. And so really trying to get people to remember that there was a very, and continues to be a, a disparate impact for different groups. There's the group of people who can go work from home. I'm working from home right now that had, you know, when the stock market bottomed out, they could put more money in and then they made 50% interest in, in 2020. And then you had the group that maybe work in service industries and those jobs just completely disappear. That affected different counties differently. Down on the coast of Georgia, that was 70% or so of what the jobs were. And so we've got two different groups. It's not that the pandemic impacted us all the same. And so when I'm trying to tell a story, finding visuals like this, but then also like being able to show that actually the data matched this. It's an illustration that's easy to remember, this K-shaped curve of the recovery, but also that's exactly how the jobs went. And so being able to show, tell the story, but that's also sort of related to what the data looks like. So a little, I'll give some examples of what our work looks like. And I think I'm like close to time already somehow. Our big platform looks like this. I'm not going to do a demo right now, but basically when I say that you can look at whatever community indicator you can think of at census tract level, at zip code level, city, county, state, uh, legislative district, this is what that tool looks like. And you can make nice little scatter plots. You can do all kinds of stuff in here. And this is just completely free. You don't need to log in or anything like that. This is our primary service and what we were founded on. Alicia Phillip, the former president of the community foundation was like, we want a single place to have for our nonprofits and grantees to be able to go to find reliable information. And so that's what we continue to maintain as one of our core services. I've got a quick series to show you what you can do with that tool and why it's important. Here's third grade reading proficiency. This is what it looks like in Metro Atlanta, just looking at the five counties. And you can start to see a clear kind of divide here. And I would say before the pandemic, we'd like to look at education separately than we would look at things like, and this is higher ed, the same pattern, but we like to look at things in silos, education and housing and vehicle access. Here's income it actually looks the same as the education maps, but when you can show all these different variables, because they're all in the, all of these indicators are in one place and you can show them all together. And this is rent burden, right? So people that are struggling to make spending more than 30% of their income on housing needs, you start to realize that all of these issues look the same on a map, which means we're probably talking about the same communities that are then experiencing barriers from the same system. So looking at particular issues. And this is where this is health insurance, but realizing the patterns between the issues that our communities are facing is actually systemic in nature. And then it helps us understand how we need more systemic responses, right? Not just an education solution, because there are lots of things going on in that neighborhood or in that household that are impacting that student performance. This is where there's no vehicles available. And so like those maps, you can make them in just like two minutes in our tool. Once you get past the learning curve of how do you actually what buttons to click and everything. These are, so I find these very impactful for telling a story. I had a workforce group up in Cobb County that wanted to expand beyond Cobb. We made a few maps for, for their grant writer and she was able to put that into an application. And now they're, they've got a grant to go do work in Clayton County. And so showing the needs, I think we were looking at opportunity youth. So 16 to 24 year olds or 16 to 19 year olds, not working and not. You did. Uh, okay. I think I'm back. <laughs> cool. The point was that you can use a visual to, to tell, help tell a narrative. And we use this for, like I mentioned, a workforce group to, to advocate or solicit dollars and they got them to go do work in Clayton County. So we did this to Alma and the guy just, he ran through some maps. There were different, there were red and orange instead of blue and purple, but it was really interesting. And so the question I have is, I'm looking at it right now. I can see how ACT has said, but where do we go for training? We want to know specific things like they did in that. Yeah, that must've been Mike. That's why I'm thin. I, I can, we can totally skip. I will email you after this and we'll just find a time to, to chat. The other question is, are there maps that show things like, here's where the city council uh, districts are. Here's where the MPs yeah. are. Cause those things are super hard to read on the city uh, website. Yeah, what we actually do is we take census data and we transform it to fit into NPUs so that, so that you can actually pull all the census data at for all 25 NPUs. And then we also subdivided those NPUs into 103 Atlanta neighborhoods. So you can actually look at the uh, neighborhood level data as well. Um, oh, man, I wish I had an emoji where I could do the head exploding. That's awesome. Yeah, we're working with the mayor's office right now because Mayor Dickens is all about the, the, his neighborhood health. And that was one of his four transition committees. So we're developing an index for the mayor's office right now to 
try to, we're going to incorporate community voice as one of the indicators, but we're doing the neighborhood level stuff with them. And they, the city planning uses our geographies that we made as well. So it's, it's nice and consistent. Fantastic. One last question. And I think, I know you're recording, so this may be useful for others that might see this. Is there something that maps actual organizations that provide specific services? That is, I would say that's the holy grail. Next year, if we don't, so we, like I mentioned earlier, we're working on this thing called Metro Atlanta Speaks to capture community voice. After that big thing, our next big thing is asset data. I'm going to be going after national funding to try to build asset maps. Right now, when we follow up, there there's, are some things that are useful, but the, this is messy data. It's based on IRS data to start with. So whether you're using GuideStar, Irene put find help, there's, or even if you look at two and one services, it's tough to navigate sometimes. And so I really want to work on developing asset data around the like community assets. And I think what's really important that just doesn't exist anywhere is what is their service area and what specific programs do they provide? And so this might look something like doing a statewide census of nonprofits or something, but I think that's just a huge thing that we need to figure out in the next couple of years. Tommy, when going to the maps, will it only pull out data that you have set up categories for now? For instance, if, if I were to go to maps and I wanted to pull out data of, of the top neighborhoods where theater goers are living or the zip codes, can I just type that in and pull it out or I have to work with you to customize that? I, I would say like the census does not ask about theater goers. So we don't have that, but what we could do is we could take, say your ticket sales data, if your database, and we could map that for you and we could help you do some analysis. And you can actually do that in this tool because you can upload your own data. So I can show y'all how to do that. And it won't be saved into our thing. It'll be just for y'all while you're using the tool, but you can upload your own data as long as you have a column that says zip code or something. And you just, you connect the geography there. You can make your own map. I can show you how to do that when we do a demo. Okay. One, one thing is our custom insights or our consulting work. So when, if you haven't heard of Neighborhood Nexus before, you've probably heard of some of our clients and so we build a lot, we do data work and we're the data partner of all of these organizations and more. We worked with Invest Atlanta and the Economic Mobility Index. We built this in 2020. I'm just showing you some examples of our work. So you can, if you're looking for something more specific than our like one big behemoth of a data tool, we've got a lot of tools like this. This is citywide. This is what those neighborhoods look like, Chandra. So we can pull data down to this level here. We know there's 230 something technical neighborhoods, but some of them are so small, some of them overlap. And there's actually some gaps between them that we built our own geography of 103 that is statistically significant and all the things it needs to be to pull data. We do the child well-being index. So this is a little bit, this is outside of the city. This is zip code level for the region, 13 county region. We also do statewide tools for early education groups, Get Georgia Reading, which is focused on third grade reading and Gears, which is focused on early education and advocacy. And then we just this week finished a, a new nurse. There's a huge nursing shortage. And so we're working with the nursing association to figure out what are some recruitment and retention strategies and what does that gap actually look like in different regions? And so we can build custom dashboards like this that really give them local or regional in, insights across the state. And they've got a whole advisory board that's going to figure out how to interpret this to know what to do next to solve our working, our nursing shortage. And then we've got this great community impact team, folks that are out there doing trainings and talking to folks and being a partner. And so from community engagement, strategic partnerships, training facilitation, building out a resource library, and then helping figure out like is consulting the right thing for you, but we're usually trying to save you as much money as possible and show you all the free tools that exist. Did you put the back of my head in there deliberately? That's our comp. Oh, well, that is you, isn't it? I did not, but I'm glad I did. And again, here's data nexus. So I think that's what I've got for today. It's really, again, more about how we're thinking about data and how you might think about data at your organization, but then we're like, we should totally follow up and I'll show you some of our tools in depth. We'll do a demo. Thank you very much. This has been super useful. 